This is Really Famous. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson and I interview famous people, but I don't just interview them like your typical interview. I'm not really interested in those same old questions. Instead, I like to know who they really are and what they really think. Last week, I released a special video only episode of Really Famous on my YouTube channel. It was an interview with Henry Winkler, who of course you know from Happy Days. He played the Fonz, Arthur Fonzarelli. Um, you know him from Barry 2 probably, which is on HBO. It's very current. He won his first Emmy for it last year. He plays acting teacher Gene Cousineau. Plus, of course, Henry has been in a long string of other things like Parks and Rec, Arrested Development, a bunch of Adam Sandler movies like The Water Boy and Click, MacGyver, Night Shift, and one of my personal faves that I remember finding on a random channel when I was a teenager, a movie called The Lords of Flatbush. It also starred Sylvester Stallone. I think he was kind of like unknown then, but I'm not sure. And I'm pretty sure that nobody else has seen it other than me, I think. But it's a good movie, I think, from my memory. I should watch it again. Anyway, I explained on last week's podcast that Henry was in town in New York, where I'm based, on a high-energy book tour for his new children's book, Alien Superstar. Side note, Henry has written quite a few books with his co-author, Lynn Oliver, including the Hank Zipster series, and here's Hank, about a kid with dyslexia, which is something that Henry found out that he has, but he didn't find out until he was a parent, and his son was struggling with some of the same things that he had. Anyway, Henry didn't have time for a full-on, beautifully meandering conversation, which of course is totally my style, and it's what you hear on the podcast. But he did set aside about a half hour for me to do a quick video interview. And the plan is that we'll sit down later for a longer, deeper talk after the book tour is long over. And another side note, we had been trying to schedule the podcast interview probably for a couple of years, but it seems like whenever I'm in Los Angeles, he's filming Barry, which is what happened last time, or when he's in New York, it's too much of a whirlwind to set aside a couple of hours. Anyway, I do hope we get to that sooner rather than later because I have so much more to talk about with him. So much more. Stay tuned. You'll be the first to know when we get it on the books. So last week, I mentioned that you can watch the interview on youtube.com slash really famous and you still can. But then I realized that you may simply not be into that. I get that. So I'm running the audio for you today. And since it's relatively short, I'm adding in my conversation with his Happy Days co-star and very good friend, Marion Ross, who of course played Mrs. Cunningham, who I talked to the last time I was in Los Angeles when Henry was knee deep filming Barry. Speaking of LA, I'm there right now. I just arrived because I was asked to do a live mini version of Really Famous on the stage at a big entertainment industry conference called Digital Hollywood. I'll be there on Thursday and I invited Patrick Fabian from Better Call Saul to be my guest on stage. So if you happen to be in town, stop over. It's at the Skirball Center on Thursday at 11.30 a.m. And later on Thursday, I'm sitting on a panel called The Voice of Women, Politics, the Arts, Feminism, Technology, Family and Work, A Day in the Life. It's being moderated by Cecily Armstrong, and the other panelists are Kim Coles, who you may remember from Living Single, and Lillian Garcia, a singer-songwriter and pro-wrestling announcer. I've also been nominated for an award at Digital Hollywood, which is pretty cool. And if you'd like to vote, just click on the Vote Now link that I put in today's show notes. So enough talking from me. Here's Henry Winkler and Marion Ross. And I just want to be honest, I was a little nervous. It's Henry Winkler after all. Plus, I had the time constraint and I knew that he didn't have the luxury of kicking back for a long, explorative interview. And that stresses me out a little bit. If you know me, you'll probably notice it. If not, okay, great, good, cool. Let's see. Oh, they're so cute. The the brown one is a year and a half, and little Maisie is 14 weeks old. Look at her legs. Oh my God. Oh my God. I can't even handle it, so they love each other? Do you know what? 
I, I, I am so lucky because they could not. Wait, who is that? No, the same dogsy. So, what do you mean they could not? They love well, each other there but too. But they don't, they're not from the same litter. Oh. And um, they could not get along. You know? Totally. Because you don't know, but they do the automatically. The big one takes, just looks to see where the little one is. <gasps> Oh my god. So it's like the big one is yeah, the is the maternal like or puppies. paternal one. So cute. Okay. So my son and I decided we were going to replicate that video. My son is 11, <gasps> but he's my youngest, but he's, he's perfect age. Yeah. For Alien Superstar. Well, yeah. So we haven't gotten it yet, but <gasps> we are going to get it next. He's read the Hank books, of course. I have and a copy for you, Kara. Oh, we'll awesome. Give it to you before we go. Awesome. And how old are the others? Uh, 19. A daughter who's 19. If you told me that you had a child who was 8, I would totally be with you. Okay. Can we? Yeah. Okay. So she is? 19. 19. And then is there another one? Yeah. There's another son. And how old is he? 16. He'll be 17 next wow. week. Congratulations. Thank you. Me too. I'm going to be 74 October 30th. Congratulations. Thank you. So, at 74, yeah. you look good, you feel good. Yeah, I do. I mean, I do. So much. Yeah. What is the 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 overlying theme of your podcast? It's called Really Famous. It's famous people who I have on as guests, but I like the real person. Do you talk to famous people? Yes. Who? Like who? Who? who your friend Marion Ross oh, was on the show famous. recently. Yeah. So Marion. She's great. Um, Chaz Palminteri. Let's see. Oh, he's famous. Danny Aiello was just on. Very famous. I good actors. Forget. You have good actors. They're mostly actors. Christopher Knight from the Brady Bunch. Um, Alan Cumming. Jessica Hecht. You know, good people. You bet. Tony Goldman. You bet. <gasps> Tony, I just saw him on Broadway. In Network. Same. It was so good. So good. Well, he's so good in everything. I know. Brian Cranston was so good. It was interesting. You know what I discovered? But I... W no, no, go. Nope. Oh. Okay. All right. Nice. I'll tell you what I discovered. Was that when I was watching Brian Cranston on camera on stage, it was so interesting to me because when you would catch it on the big screen, you could really see something else. Yes. The Except that I up. thought it was insane that he forced theater goers to see a lot of the show on screen. Okay. And that's why you watch TV. You go to theater right. uh, to see the actor and not be separated by the cool medium. Got which it. cools it down. I feel you. Yeah. I see what you're I saying. I thought that, that was a little crazy. And then you don't go to the theater to see a whole bunch of people actually having dinner on the stage. Right, which they did. Right. That was a little distracting. So that was like dinner theater. I, I mean, what, what's the point? There would be no, they would not be anywhere in the reality of that play, except that they sold more money. Yeah, well, is, was that the point of it? I think so. Because the people would pay extra the to be up yeah, on the stage. Yeah, the tickets were, were more expensive. But also, that would be so awkward, I don't think I would want to be in one of those seats. No! <laughs> right? And people are watching you have a spaghetti. Exactly. A little weird. Yeah. Oh. All right. So, let's start off with your book. You're on a book tour now. Yes. You're in New York. This is our first day of the book tour. And the book is about a young um, alien lives on the Red Dwarf planet. Uh, his real name is uh, Zeta5866. You could call him 66 if you want. And his grandmother, Wrinkle, Grandma Wrinkle, wants to free him because it's a repressive planet. And at 13, they cut off his ability to enjoy culture sound, taste, uh, color, um, and he just is like a, a zombie so that he causes no problem for the regime. Oh, okay. She builds the spaceship because she is the master mechanic for the starship fleet on that planet. Okay. He takes off just in the nick of time and travels through space passes Saturn with its beautiful brown and pink rings 
and lands on the only address that he and Grandma Wrinkle know on Earth. The back lot of Universal Studios. And I don't know how this happened, but he becomes the, the star of a sitcom on Universal. Starring a young woman who is biracial, a musician. It's a hit show. He gets a, a part as an alien. And it is, we thought, children love aliens. Mm -hmm. And the concept of stardom, of the red carpet, of what is it to work in Hollywood. Everybody dreams now because of the internet and the glossy magazines and television about Hollywood. Lynn has uh, produced TV. F she worked at, a, at Universal for 11 years producing shows. Like what shows? Uh, Harry and the Hendersons, for one. Oh, okay. Uh, and um, she wrote, I have produced and acted. Mm-hmm. Boom. We put it together, and so it is a stranger in a strange land. And his innocence discovers the good and the bad of working in Hollywood. So there is good and there is bad. Oh yeah. And you know it. Well, I've, I've, I've seen it all. Yeah, I guess you have seen it all. And it's so, I mean, so different, I guess, what you see now. It's probably different from what it was then, right? The only difference between well, I'm Hollywood talking about like now, Barry time and Happy Days I know Happy what Days you time. mean. Okay. The difference between Happy Days and Barry is only one technology. How to make television, you still need talented people, you need a great script, you need to record it, and it is where you show it that is so different. Little did I ever imagine when I first started Happy Days, I would be... Hi. And, oh, hi. Little did I know that I would be um, watching TV on my phone. Right, right. That's amazing. It is amazing. And so many people, especially young people too. So like a lot of the kids who people are going to be on reading the book. Everybody yeah, on yeah, the plane. Yeah, And even with the screens, the movie screens on the back of the seats, people are still pulling out their phones. Absolutely. And their iPads. Because they're watch. watching their own content. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, content that they've chosen. So people haven't changed at all in Hollywood, do you the think? The people have not changed. Um, I will tell you the, the one thing that I, I see a little bit different. The young, the young stars don't yet understand, or a lot of them don't, that there are two halves to the making of the show, the movie, the podcast, the stream. You have to make it, and you have to sell it. Oh, yes. People have to know it exists because there is so much to watch. You must go out, and you must, as hard as it is, beat the bushes. Yeah, because I don't think that at all was the case then. Like, you could be a TV star. You could be the Fonz, right? And then whoever was marketing it then would market it, and there were only those channels. You were and on ABC, on right? On the weekends, we would leave Hollywood. We would fly to Wanamaker's in Philadelphia. We would appear. We would fly to Dallas and go to Neiman Marcus. 25,000 people came. You, you went to um, Philadelphia, you did the Mike Douglas show, or um, the Merv Griffin show, mm -hmm. the Tonight Show. You did it exactly the same way. Yeah. So now it's different. You have to get out there. You have to do it. Have to do it. Um, so how is like, for example, you are on a media tour for the book, but you have to do it for Barry too, right? You have to do it for all of the projects. Yes. So I know while you're here, you had that you were on the Today Show already. Right. You're going to be on Jimmy Fallon, yes, right? I am. Um, and you're also going to do these book signings where you present. Well, that is a lot of fun. My partner Lynn Oliver and I have a PowerPoint. And we have a story to tell. And we start from when I was um, four. There is, I found a picture, because I always say that I wanted to be an actor since I was seven. We found a picture of me when I was seven as Dopey, one of the dwarfs. Cute. 
um, and then tell the story of how we came together, how we have decided to write this book, and um, the telling of the book. And then I read from the book. Okay, so question for you personally. Okay. I, you seem like you're an extrovert. I am an extrovert when I need to be. I am an extrovert, and my extrovertness is on call. Okay, so on the other time, I have speed dial. Okay, so it comes quickly. You don't have to really muster it no. up. But the other times... I can be very, very quiet. Like when? Like what do you like do when, when is I'm it? home. What do you do at home? Uh, we, um, I watch TV. I love television. I watch, I test everything. We go to the movies. We play with our grandchildren. We um, uh, take them to dinner. We have family dinners. But you're, there are people again here. These are people things. But they are family things where I'm not required to be an entertainer. So you're not on. I am Papa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I'm Dad. Or I'm Henry. So it's not so much that you need the alone time to recharge. Well, I do. I do take alone time. Okay. Uh, in my own house. Um, I sit in the backyard. I play ball with the with the puppies. Uh, Sadie, who is the older, she's a year and a half, will play ball with you for 24 hours a day. Maisie, who is 13 months old, runs six or seven steps and then lies down on the grass. They do what they want to do. They do. What they, they don't care do. what you want them to do. No. I have a Labrador Retriever. Okay. She will go chase a stick. Right. She's not that into a ball. Okay. So sometimes she'll play, but well, then she'll, she'll be done. Well, we had a King Charles Cavalier who I would throw the ball and he would... That was it? Yeah. yeah. So do you get recognized when you're out? Not at a thing like this. Always, right? Every, all the time. You are so recognizable. I am. But for every different thing. It depends on the age. Uh, for books, some children know me only as a reader. Mm -hmm. Now, 25-year-olds know me because they read the books. Uh, Happy Days, uh, Scream. I mean, these are things that people will say. Uh, Waterboy, uh, Arrested Development, uh, Parks and Rec. The travel show I did with uh, Terry Bradshaw and, uh, and, and uh, Bill Shatner and George Foreman, Better Late Than Never, and now Barry. So it's their age and probably where they are, right? Like what part of the country maybe too? Or no. No. No, no television so is more universal. Age. Oh, wait, so let's back up a second. You said something was interesting to me. You're into TV. You watch it. I love it. What are your favorites? Let's see. I, um, my, we love uh, Secession. Uh, there is a Spanish show called Money Heist. Oh, I just and if started. you haven't seen Money Heist, make sure you have time because you will not watch just one. That's on Netflix. And like I think a I watched potato three. Chip. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have more shows like that for you if you're into. If you don't mind subtitles. I don't mind subtitles. Then Fauda. Uh huh. Oh, unbelievable. Um, and then I love um, America's Got Talent. Oh, that's yeah. a, that's so you have diverse interests. Oh, I, I yes. Um, Gamora. Gamora. You seen it? Fabulous. That's like my favorite. F every episode. El Marginal is another one. It's a prison no, I have movie not though. Seen it it's yet. a little rough. Yeah. But it's that same kind of thing. Right. There's a lot of things going on. A lot of suspense. Absolutely. It's quite a story, and yes. there are interesting characters within. Yes. Okay, so you also like uh, competition shows. I like competition, but I like talent. Talent only. I okay. am overwhelmed by talent. There is a young man who sang on America's Got Talent. His name is Benicio Bryant. He is extraordinary. Fourteen. Okay. Extraordinary. Is this current? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, three weeks ago. Oh, all right, good. Okay, so it'll be interesting to watch that. So, um, okay, so you do get recognized. You seem I to I get recognized all over the earth. You can't, you don't try to hide it, or no. do you? And you no, no, I didn't I'm think 74, you did. and I'm not about to hide it. 
So you I, I go and people are unbelievably warm. They adore you. I, I, I don't know if they adore me. All I know is they are unbelievably warm. People are incredibly generous with their, um, with their warmth to me. So you just get good vibes. I get really good vibes. What about when somebody tries to take a picture of you? When you well, it you used to be, oh, I forgot my camera. I wish I could take a picture with you. Well, I'm really sorry. It was a pleasure to meet you. Now, let's take a selfie. Now you can't, can't get away from it. Or they would say, hey, you know what? Stay right there. I've run out of film. This is when you had to put film in your camera. I'll be right I'm just going to buy some film. Go, I, you know what? I don't think I'm going to wait here, but gosh, thank you so much for inviting me to do that. <laughs> Go buy some film. Get out of here. Are you serious? That's so funny. Yeah. And then they, do they try to like sneak it when you're not looking and you know oh, so you're being... Oh, so many people. I, you know what? I, I don't even think. My wife says, that guy over there is trying yeah, to take a picture yeah. of me. Go, what, what am I going to do? Right. But it's, I would imagine it's kind of hard too because you're always being watched at that point. But I don't think about that. Mm. I am not completely aware of that. Okay. Uh, it you know because I do a lot of watching myself. You're an observer, which I'm I think a lot of actors are, yeah. right? So you like. And to I see love seeing famous people. Like, you know, like you know what really, really, really makes me angry. I went to see Bruce Springsteen for the fifth time on Broadway. Not five times on Broadway, but for the fifth time, it, he was on Broadway. And um, uh, Michael Douglas and his beautiful wife, uh, was Catherine, there, Catherine Jones. Yeah. and uh, uh, Jeremy Irons was there. And I didn't have the wherewithal to take a selfie with him. And it really just, re I'm, I'm hoping the next time I'm going to. I did with Bobby De Niro. You did? Oh, yeah. Good for you. Where was this? He reminded me. Now, tell me about feeling good. I met Robert De Niro at a, um, a premiere of his film that uh, Nancy Meyershire directed. It was called The Intern. Oh, I love that movie. And I went up and I said, look, I I'm so sorry. I, I have to do this. I met him for the first time and waved with Ron Howard walking down the street on Paramount Lot when he was shooting Godfather 2. They used the mill, the, uh, the uh, place where they build the sets, uh, the actual carpentry shop, car carpentry, car that shop, yeah. uh, they, they used it for a set. And we walked by and we said, we have to say hello, we have to say hello. We have to Okay. But I told him, because the first movie I saw in Hollywood uh, at a premiere, when I first arrived, was Mean Streets by, with Martin, Martin Scorsese directed and Bobby De Niro. And I said, you use the word fuck better than any human being on the earth. Forty years later, when I went to take the selfie, he said, you know, you said to me, I say fuck better than anybody. I said, I remember it, and I did. And it blows my mind that you remember that. That's awesome. And if you didn't go up to him, you would have never known. If you didn't have that take that selfie with him, you would have never known. I would have never known. That he, all those years. Oh, my God. But you're right about that. In Mean Streets. <gasps> It, I saw Mean Streets for the first time ever, maybe a month ago. Fact. Oh, because it wow. came on to Netflix or something. And I was like, oh, Mean Streets, I missed that one somehow. And I saw it, you know, and Kaitel and him. And you're right. It's something about the way <sighs> he says that. It's amazing. It is. He's he nailed it and he remembered it. So yeah. you get starstruck sometimes. I do. I get very starstruck. Mainly with, um, with uh, music stars. I went into our Whole Foods. And a woman walked up to me, because I tweet about her all the time, and said, I'm Sia. I went, oh my god. <laughs> and I'm because of not only that, but I've only seen her wearing a wig in front of her face. So I've never seen her face. Her. And it was just amazing. So yeah, that's amazing. So people come up to you, and some of them are probably feeling like, I can't go up to him. I don't this know is... about that. All I know is I get excited to meet people 
that I like. Yeah, yeah, and it's good that you're a fan too. You've been watching TV and you go out to yes. movies all these years. So like that we watch a, a, a Snowfall, uh, which is on FX. Yeah. And I wrote the star, uh, Damson. Uh, I wrote him a fan letter. Uh, and he got it in South Africa, where he's making a movie, and he emailed me back. Well, of course. Why wouldn't he email you back? I wrote Jeff Daniels uh, when I uh, saw him on Newsroom. Wrote me back. See, I have to say also that a lot of people, even if they observe something they like about someone or they see someone doing something, whether it's a famous person or somebody in their life, and it's meaningful and they like it and they're moved by it, they don't always say it or go out of their way to let that I other think person it's mandatory. know. But most people don't, and it doesn't mean that they're that they're not thinking it. But I think few people hear from people who are impacted. But my thinking it. Look, you, you cannot act for or by yourself. It really is communal. It is mainly in a theater that's where it was born. That theater is filled and the compression between the human beings and you make an explosion of energy in that space. When you are moved I think it is mandatory that you let those people know that they were great. I wrote a letter to Patricia Arquette Escape for Danamora. Danamora. That's right. I wrote a letter so to um, Sam Rockwell because I thought he became Fosse. Yeah, just um, so, amazing. what do you do? Do you actually write a physical letter? Do you email? I write a physical letter, um, uh, but because I can't spell, I write uh, some of the letter and I type it because then my brain doesn't have spell check. You know, if yes. I make a mistake, I don't autocorrect. So how do you get the spellings then? At that, so we're talking about it, so it's dyslexia. I at have work to here. yell um, at my assistant. Okay, how do you spell? How do you spell schedule? Right. You know, there's something now called uh, Google Voice typing. So you can actually say what you want to type. Yeah, and it'll but pick you know, up most on my it. phone, people uh, send me um, uh, like voice messages yeah. when they didn't didn't get the phone, didn't pick up. Yeah. And I don't know what they're right, saying. Right, because it transcribes it poorly. Yes. Yeah, right, so. and then you have to go in. But I'm just saying this because my son uses it oh, in school. Yeah. They let Charlie. him do the voice. Exactly, Charlie uses Charlie. it. Well, well, tell Charlie I need it. I, <laughs> I got my first fan letter from Alien Superstar. I sent it to a little boy uh, who I, I know his father, and he wrote me back. He said, you know, I've, written, I've read a lot of Alien stories. Your Alien is warm and funny. He's not scary and mean. I thought, how is that the greatest? Totally. Yeah. So you made him human and right. Why do aliens have to be? Well, now let me tell you something. In real life, I am convinced that an alien will land somewhere in my vicinity and they will be friendly. Okay. Uh, but I've, since I was a little boy, I believe that. E.T. friendly. Right? Hello. One of the best. Okay. So one last question then. How yes. about how has what has writing books done for you personally in your life? Okay. First of all, it taught me that anything is possible. Th I didn't read a book until I was thirty one, let alone write a book. It brings me pleasure. I work with Lynn Oliver. She sits at the computer, I sit on the other side of her desk. When I come into her office, I have no idea what we're going to write. And some of it, uh, we make up right then and there, right, as we're writing. And it, when I leave, there was nothing when I started. There are six or seven pages that never existed before. I'm proud. And the children write us and say, how did you know me so well? Mm -hmm. Because we don't write down to the children. That makes me happy. So I'm astounded, I'm proud, I'm happy. And um, I'm doing something that never occurred to me in my whole life. So glad that you took that path, that side path, on behalf of it was everybody. A, it was like, um, yeah. you know. I, I started writing because it was a time filler, mm -hmm. because there was a lull in my career. 
who knew there would be a lull in my career? Thank you so much. You're my best. Here's a Marion Ross. I was 40 when I, when I got divorced. 40. A divorce was like, what a failure. What a, it, nobody got divorced. Now everybody gets divorced every other minute. You know, it was something really weird. Shocking and shameful. A failure. So you felt like a failure. Oh, yeah. But I think, what did you like about that husband? What was it? He didn't stand in my way somehow. Isn't that interesting? In fact, you went all you went all around the bush and picked somebody, huh? Like that, yeah. I don't want to be Mrs. Him, obviously. Ah, pretty complicated. So, it, I did have to go to the shrink and find out what was that about. So, did the shrink help you figure that out? I, I don't. I can't put my finger on what I learned from the shrink but we but we learn things uh-huh. and then we get to the point where we think I think I can handle this and then you if you <clears throat> like going to the doctor you should go back if you're in a crisis there's a good time to go back and study yourself what's all this about I think when I when I got on happy days now I'm 50 when I go and get on happy days and that's a complicated dynamic to be on a TV hitch TV show. And that was a good time for me to go back again. It's hard, and you're in the limelight, and there's a heavy, heavy competition. Everybody there is a A type, you know, every one of us, you know. So everyone where? Everyone there? Oh, at, on, on the set. On at, the at set. Paramount, say, like on Happy Days. Uh-huh. Or if you're in Hollywood, we're all A-types. We're all winners here. In fact, there's a, the there's a other side of those A-type people, which is very shy. It's a, it's a mixed blessing, isn't it? But they have a lot of drive. They cannot stand it. So everyone you're saying is like that? I, I and that some think, people just hide I, it? I think people that come here on their own to do this thing, yeah. That it, it eats away at you if you don't if you're not getting what you want, you you can't be oh that'd be a cute idea. Oh, in fact, I can remember going to this to the school and they would some of the mothers would say oh you're an actress are you an actor well that sounds like fun well that must be fun. I thought yeah why don't you do it why don't you give that a whirl yeah <laughs> you give that a whirl and you think if, if you think that's fun seriously fun. you were driven from the beginning you were re- driven from when you were a child yes because I've, I was a middle child were you a middle child no I was the younger of two so I'm okay. the baby the baby yeah so I'm the middle child and second little girl my my brother was a, was a crippled boy so in order for me to get any attention, which I, which I wanted a lot, I didn't get very much attention. So there is and, a middle child and, syndrome. Unless I created, unless I somehow dug it out. So that does exist, you're saying, and it's real, the middle child syndrome. Well, you're the second little girl. Yeah. And then, like, 16 months later, come, finally comes the boy. Now comes the little brother then he my brother Gordon had a was born with some sort of condition in one of his legs and the bone was soft so he, all his youth, earthy early youth he was in a cast in a brace in a hospital so he got a great deal of attention when we would go somewhere he's being wheeled and pushed in something then he'd be off in a so for me to get I just stand dutifully by his little walker thing and be polite get any attention at all Mm. I had to be so special so special Right. Yeah. So, did you realize that then, or do you looking I, I, back? It's looking it? back that I realize it so so well. Yeah. You decided though at an early, at a young age, you wanted to go to Hollywood. And wait, where did you meet your husband again? Well, I didn't meet. 
I met my husband in college. In college. At San Diego State College. Right. So you were in San Diego. You met in college. Very quickly, you decided, this is it. He's yeah. the one for me. Even though you knew that he could sort of uh, derail your acting career, which or you had your sights on an acting career right but off the I, bat. That didn't enter my mind ever. Never? It was, I just liked the drama of this. He said, when you going to marry me? And... and and I said, no, I'm not going to. It. So I'm not in love with you. Yes, you are in love with me. Come on, we're going to go get married right now, tonight. So it was very traumatic for my family. They were very upset. Because because I ran so off. quickly? Well, because you ran, I ran off. off. And I'm still a senior in college. You know, ran yeah. off and get married. So they were shocked. They did not cope well. No, because I had done all this big talk of going to be an actress. So they so were what, worried about it getting derailed, well, not you. Well, what happened was a woman at San Diego State who taught Spanish, who, since I ran off and eloped, and I'd been in all the plays at college, I'd done all the, all the plays, she came to me and she said, I have connections in Hollywood, and I'm going to take you, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll go on the train, and we will go go to Hollywood I'll take you up there so this was immediately after my running off getting married and she pushed me and we went to 20th Century Fox and met Tyrone Powers manager and very everybody was very nice to me then she would call them up and say we then we got on the train and went to home to San Diego and <clears throat> she would call and say what are you going to do about Marion she was like my agent and they said well she should come uh, to Hollywood so uh, I, I don't know if I even asked my young husband but anyway the plan was I should go to Hollywood live at the dorm at the, at the UCLA finish my college and go on interviews in, in Hollywood I guess I didn't ask him this is going to be the plan okay so he stayed in San Diego while you did that well he, and then the minute we ran off and got married, he, we were moving into a funny little um, garage apartment, and they said, oh, you have a letter. He was called back into the service. Well, okay, he goes uh, off to Korea, and I go up to L.A., and I even had to get a job because I'd never had a job ever. And I got a job at Bullock's. I knew the alphabet. I knew the alphabet. I could file. I filed pieces of paper. And then meanwhile, I would go to Paramount on auditions. And you got role. I know it took a long time, but you got role after role after role after role. Like... When you look at your the credits that you yeah. had, it's extraordinary. So I know you kept feeling like you wanted like the big role, right? But you were on everything, it seems I know. like. You know, Tony Curtis, I'm in Operation Petticoat. And what's his na wife's name? Lee, uh, yeah, Janet Lee. Janet Lee. Uh -huh. Janet Lee. She wasn't in the, in the show, but they were married, and she was there on the... So I always felt... Mm, really not quite up to snuff always you know everybody was really swifter than me you know but that was the way I was and in probably in, in a interesting way that was maybe part of my appeal that I, I was this very natural and Ingrid Bergman was my idol I, I wanted to be like Ingrid Bergman I remember you on the Brady Bunch I know it was only one episode. Right, and Florence was a very good friend of mine. Okay. Very good. Florence has passed away. I know. Yeah. Terrible. She was on the love boat, too, that uh, in Florida that we were on together. Oh, yes, she was. Where we met the first time, I know you don't remember, but I remember it very well. It was the love boat reunion. I think they were, uh, Princess Cruises was christening a ship, mm -hmm. um, and they brought all of these, not only the cast of the love boat, all of these actors who appeared on the love boat right. because of course they had new guest stars every week right. 
And you were there, of course, right. looking radiant as always. And you were big on the love boat. You were important. Well, at, at one point, after I, uh, all of our writers from Happy Days, Happy Days was over after 10 years, 11 years, they all went over to work on the love boat. So then they called me, the writers, and said, we got a great idea. We want you to come and marry the captain. Oh, okay. I, I said, well, that's a great idea. And I knew Gavin anyway. Oh, so, you knew Gavin, right. You worked with him on something else, right? On Operation Petticoat. Yes. So I said, well, that's a great idea. I love Gavin. So we'll be, we'll be great together. So Also, Gavin is great. He's a wonderful guy. I love him. He is one of the greatest, seriously. Just like, he's such a wonderful. good guy. Yeah. Um, do you watch TV? Not so much. Not so much. I don't watch episodic television. I'm watching the tennis now, you know? Oh, okay. Right? I mean, I'm retired. Isn't that nice? It is nice. You're in this beautiful home. You have all these pictures, photos. You have these. Oh, look, I see this. I just noticed that. This is, uh, okay, it looks like something that's framed. That's my star it's your on star. the Walk of Fame. Right. Right. So what is this? Like they give you a replica or does somebody make a replica or something, a little yes, one? Yes, that went for you to take home. The whole cast came, Gary Marshall, everybody, and uh, w we all had a wonderful time. That is so cool. What, what did you feel like when you got that star? I couldn't believe, I thought it was a joke, because my son came to me and he had this letter, you know, and I thought, this is not true. This is a, because I know that Tom Bosley wanted a star, and he never got one. So you can't, you can't, I don't know how my son, and I even said to him, did you have to buy that? Did you buy that star? What happened? He said, we had to pay some money. Yeah. <laughs> But I don't think that's the only thing you can do is pay money right, to get a right, star. Because no. I think plenty of people would pay the money yeah, right. if that would get them the star. Right, so yeah. I think you, you have to pay the money, but that's not what decides yeah. it. So, so I'll, I'll have to go. Next time I go down to, to Sunset Boulevard or Hollywood, Hollywood, Boulevard, Hollywood Boulevard, across from Grauman's Chinese, you know. Is that where you are, where yes, your star I'm is? Yes, I'm on the other side. Mm. Yep. And and see how, how it looks and see if it, in fact, one day I thought, I've got to, I'm gonna walk the block and, and see who else is on my block because there's all these stars. So Tom Bosley wanted one, didn't get one. Um, and you had an interesting story about him in the book. I don't think anybody would have believed it that he was kind of abrasive, at least at the beginning. He was, Tom was tough on me and I think he wanted somebody else in the part and for some reason, I was not important enough or something. So he, he, he didn't like me. And that's, you know, that's possible. Well, I, I remember Henry one time said to me, Marion, I don't know what it is, but somehow it's all your fault. I said, I, I, I think it probably is. I don't know. Well, what is it? What do I do to him? I don't understand. It probably, what? So I, I what was know. it about you that triggered I, him? I wonder. I, I, I don't know him. I, first of all, I'm sure he maybe had in mind somebody else. Did he? Was he like that with everyone, or just mainly you? M mainly me. Mainly me. He didn't like me, and and he was he was a peppery kind of guy. Peppery, and w we became really good friends through the years. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so because it all we were there out. 10, 11 years together. Right, but at the beginning, yeah. what was it? Just two no. years or three or something? No, he I, just... I thought, God, I can't believe it. I've got this wonderful job, and I got to be married to him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I looked like I was the happiest wife in the world. You sure oh, did, didn't it? You would never know. That's acting. That's called acting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But at, so at home, in the meantime, you're playing the happiest wife well, in the I world. Well, I cry. I so cry. Come crying. home and cry. Yeah, feel bad. But yes. Henry, Henry was a wonderful friend, and Ron, of course, was wonderful. Wonderful. Everybody was wonderful. So Henry and you, there was just something special about your bond. I think, right? And you could see it on the show, and they, yeah. the writers wrote that in because no. I could see. We're, and even now. He calls me to be sure that, that I'm fine, you know. Isn't that nice? That is so nice. So we, we really bonded. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, Chachi, Scott Bayo lives around here, right? He does. He lives across the street or right over there. That is such a coincidence. Right. I know. Do you see him or no? Not very much. Mm. 
But you do talk to Henry, and do you talk to Ron? Uh huh. Ron Howard. But Ron's a pretty busy guy. But if I needed anything, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm hoping that they're all going to come to to my house next week for for supper because we want to get together. What what will you eat? Like who, somebody will bring well, in I food. Will, I will go since I'm not much of a cook. I'll get I'll get the food from the deli. Yeah. Yes, and we'll have a wonderful time. Yeah. Anson. Uh, we'll be here and Donnie most Henry but he's Henry's very busy working on his show right that Barry. Barry on Barry so whether he can't get away at night I don't know because sometimes they shoot at night so we'll just see if we can work it out did you ever like to cook no I I'm not much of a cook <laughs> I would say to my children what do you mean you're hungry eat something yeah yeah <laughs> well <laughs> right so you have two kids Jim and Ellen yes and do you know who my son is? Jim Meskimen. And he's on so many things and so many commercials. And he's so talented. You have to look him up on the internet. Well, that's funny because I was reading your book and I was reading that part on the plane the other day where you said he was in Happy Days and so was Ellen. Uh-huh. And it's so interesting that he was in like such a memorable episode of well, Happy yeah, Days. The shark. Look. Yes, it's jump a shark. The shark. It's a shark. Jump in the shark. So he's the one who says. Yeah, it's a shark. It's a shark. You used the last name Meskimen in your personal life growing up, or no? No, I, ne- no, I never did. I didn't like it, and, and I wanted my own name. And Ellen works on shows, too, on TV. Well, Ellen was a writer-producer on Friends, excuse me. That's major. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Ellen is creating a new show for ABC, oh. I think. And, you know, she's a- always creating something, and she's just wonderful. Uh huh. She's got two little kids. Going back to the beginning, what we were talking about with your husband, and you didn't realize it at the time. So you were married for how many years? Oh, 19 years. 19 years. They weren't happy years, really. Well, who, who, who had a happy marriage anyway? You know, not anybody that I could see. The really? Same, yeah, this was, this was okay, you know. Oh, that's interesting. What did you see of other people's marriages? You know. It wasn't just bed of roses at all, you know? It's interesting because I think people don't always show their bad marriages, right? Like, you, they may be bad inside. And my mother and father were not happy together. Oh, they weren't? No. When did you realize that? Oh, I would think very early, probably. I mean, and I thought that was typical of many marriages. I don't know. So because this was pre-divorce. Now, when you get into the 50s and 60s, not everybody was getting divorced. Sure. That was your example of a marriage is basically two yeah. people who don't want to be together. No, it's not, it's not great, no. Uh, so you, but the Well, nice look at what, what are the statistics. What, what is, it's 50-50. Isn't it with getting divorced? I think it's about there. It may have lowered a little bit, you but think not so? much. I think so. I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up. But um, so you were you so it didn't feel that strange to you that you weren't that happy with your husband. But just to give people listening the idea of what was happening, he wanted to be an actor, but didn't really go out and try to do anything to make it happen. He wasn't really even going to auditions. You were like. Fierce. You were doing it. You had your eyes on what you wanted, and you were taking all the necessary steps to do it. But I guess the nice thing about being married to him, and like you said earlier, that you chose somebody like him, is that he didn't interfere with that No, for you. he didn't stand in my way. Right, which many husbands could have done. Oh, would they have wouldn't done. have, no. They would not have stood for no, it. No, if you marry Mr. A-type, you have to follow him around and do what he, he's the leader. So... But then you also had the fact that he was drinking. Well, that came later. As far as I could see, everybody drank. My father never didn't drink. He's Scotsman. He didn't drink. But as far as our young group of people that we ran around with, they all drank, I thought. That was the time. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody's having like cocktails oh, or whatever. Oh, yes. like in their oh, very much glass, so. Very much like so. Like Mad Men era kind oh, of. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Now, wow, it was a big... Shock! Wow, when he's alcohol, alcoholic, what is that? What is that? Yeah, 
So I, I am a rather naive person because alcohol was not in, in my family line anywhere, you know? So this is a surprise. When were you surprised by it? How did you discover it? He said, I'm going to check myself into the hospital. Oh, oh so I said, well, and he was always ill, kind of ill all the time. So I said, well, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Well, it was a hospital for alcoholics to dry out. And so it took forever for me to get this. I, In fact, I had, at the same time, I had a good friend, and she said, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I said, you are? I said, well, don't be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what is that? Well, don't. Don't be. So it's like... I, I had to really educate myself. What was that all about? Wow. What did you do? How did you educate yourself at that point? I went with her to an AA meeting. And I thought, I don't, I don't want to become the wife of an alcoholic. I don't want to spend, and my children, the children of an alcoholic. I don't know. So that was the beginning of trying to get a divorce. I thought, no, I don't want it. So the beginning of it, what happened after that? What was, were the other parts of it? <clears throat> it's a long, well, and I was working on all those shows, you know? And once, once you decide to get divorced, which I did, then I'm still responsible for the children and the things. So it was a tough, tough 10 year period. I'm running my career, so I have to earn a living. Because he's not really working. No. No. And then, fortunately, another woman took him on, so that was good. Another and, woman? What do you mean? A, a girl who had been his secretary, so it took him on. Oh. So he moved in with her. Oh, so then you felt a little bit like relief, maybe? or Well, I thought, well, yeah. So, mm. but, but still, he was part of our life part of my children's life and they would go off you know and spend a two or three day weekend with him you know so it was a very tough lonely period for me unhappy period for me isn't that funny see i don't think of it ever anymore were you aware of how unhappy you were at the uh, yes time? i cried every day how old were you then? From 40 to 50 was a very, very tough period for me. Now when I'm 50, I got happy days. Now the first few years of happy days, that's tough because I, I, I got to learn the dynamics of that family, you know? So there was a period which, where I rented out one of the bedrooms because my mother used to do this during the Depression. You could rent out a bedroom, and this was a college girl, and I, I would just have to scrimp through the best I could. I go on an interview some t some TV show, and I'd say, "This is a terrible part. <laughs> this is a terrible part," and I would start to cry. It's a terrible part. He said, "Well, uh, we'll take it anyway. Take it, take it. You know, and now or get her a cup of coffee. I mean, get her a glass of water. You know, and be because I was so raw, I was so raw, <laughs> and." People were always nice to me, but I mean, I had, I had to earn a living. I had two children to support. And it sounded like you were earning a living pretty, pretty. I mean, you were, you were getting these jobs. I, I, I would always somehow get a job and go. Like I remember going one time, I was depressed and I had just eaten half of a chocolate cake, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, frosting all over your face. The phone rings and he said, can you get down to so-and-so, uh, you know, I said, okay, I'll, I'll go. So I go on this interview, and I remember saying to them, I'm too fat. I'm too fat anyway, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and they said, oh, yeah, she wouldn't be good for that part, but she'd be good for that other part. She'd be, so people were always helping me. <laughs> 
can't believe uh, you would say that. Yeah. And they, would, they would decide to help you. Yeah, there's yeah. something about you they liked you. Yes, I get <laughs> but yeah, so there were a lot of ups and downs. I don't think people realize that about you at all. They think you have or had the life, you know, especially then, yeah, that they saw on TV. No, because I had to rent out the room. My neighbor, my neighbor was so wonderful. My Doris Adams, she would bring down a big tray with dinner cooked because half the time uh, she'd say, what are you going to have for dinner? I'd say, oh, beats me. So she would say, are you having beats me again for dinner? <laughs> I don't know what, because I'm not much of a cook anyway. It's a wonder that my children lived, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they survive and then they become resourceful from it. They learn yeah. how to take care of themselves and how to figure things out. Yeah. And they could see that show business is not very glamorous. Right. It's, you have to, it's selling. It's salesmanship of the highest order and you're the product. So you have to how do you, tell me about that. More about that. How is it salesmanship of the highest order? Yeah. You somehow it's when you think and you've got to think of it that way they're not going to come and find you they're not going to discover you so you at one point I hired a press agent I was 25 years old I said I see how this business works ah it's selling it's advertising ah I would read the trades in the you don't read the trades now do you I would well, read the trades every day. I yeah. do. I read the Hollywood Reporter has a really? newsletter that comes out every morning. It's an email. Okay. But it has so much information. In it. Right. That's all I do. But I feel like I'm not in entertainment, even though I guess I am. I feel yeah. like everybody I talk to is in entertainment. Yeah. But I suppose I am as well. Yeah, you are. Yeah. What is this about? This is selling. Oh, once you get... Now, we assume you're a terrific actor. That you got conquered. Mm -hmm. Now, because I could see lesser talent doing just great because they made friends with somebody, or they did this or that or that. You pick up the trades and they're, so I, it's like. Uh, so you would even notice. Learn, learn to play this game. Uh -huh. So Barbara, I had a Barbara Best was her name. She was a press agent. And. Everybody in San Diego knew her. She had a big contract at 20th Century Fox. She worked for Stanley Kramer. And she took a tremendous interest in me. So you hired her because you realized you needed her to play the game. And she really was behind you. Yes. So I was lucky to have her. How did you find her? Why did you pick because her? Because she was from San Diego. So I knew the people that ran one of the big magazines. I'm very involved with the theater in San Diego, the Globe Theater, mm -hmm. and Barbara like devoted her life to me. It was she extraordinary. Did. So, but she had other clients too, right? She did. But for some reason, like she Ruta liked Lee was a big client of hers. But but she liked you. But she, she a lot, so mm -hmm. that she was she was close. And my young husband thought she was just a pain in the neck, you know, you know. Uh. But I stuck with her. And what because did she do for you? What did, what did she start to do that changed we, things? We, we created a campaign. We took out ads in the trades. Uh, you know, we, we would photograph me. It made a calendar, and I'm photographing myself in different months, of, and this was a special. You know, so we'd come up with schemes. Ah, that's and, so Or she would take me on interviews to people with the press. Right. Who says, we're going to, half the time, I didn't have anything to say. I didn't have anything to sell, you know, so you, you make up a few things or something. But she's, meanwhile, training me, training me. Mm, and then you got better at selling yourself? Well, I, I kept Barbara all my life until she got, got ill and mm. yeah no she was always in my life yeah and it is so you realize from the beginning I, real, I treated it like a business yeah I didn't expect anybody ever to come and take care of me because as a child I was that way I took care of myself mm -hmm. and I thought I see how this business works yeah. <gasps> I got it Look at this person. He's related to this person. To this. Ah, if you see Hollywood, the, the in-growth is tremendous. Or mm -hmm. politics. We want to be a Kennedy? Good. That's a good idea to be a Kennedy. It'll get you somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Once you get the picture of how this is done, 
Now, now there's a map of what you yes, need to do to get I, where you want. Yeah. Don't sit around here waiting to be discovered, baby. Uh-huh. This is not going to happen. You have to make this happen. And am you I did t- it. Am I teaching you? Yes. Am no, I you're right. You? Yeah. You're right. I heard somebody say once, I think it was Alec Baldwin, but you know, never mind that. But Alec Baldwin said something like, there's no talent police that come and find you no. and say, boy, do you have talent? No. We're taking you, whatever. Yeah. And I do think that's like what you're saying. You really well, need if to I, be. I remember going to have, having supper with Shirley Jones in Sardis. We were going to do some event, and, and, we, and she was telling me about her life, that she also had a, a manager who like devoted his life to her. Oh. So every if you find somebody who's really successful, there's some one person there that is looking out for you all the time. Like everyone you think who's really that successful has you somebody. Find, if you scratch down and find out, find out who is mm-hmm. behind this person, yeah. who's helping. Because our nature is to we're, we're sensitive and we pull back we, we succeed and then we then we get scared and we pull back so you need meanwhile you need somebody who is constantly maybe a mother you know like yeah. one of those stage, stage mothers moms, yeah. you know somebody who's pushing you looking out for you or somebody else who that's what they do best is they're constantly yeah, trying and, to and, yeah knock those doors down or figure out those ways to get you as their client right. into that that's a lesson for everybody who wants to make it in Hollywood. But you or can't just make that person happen, you know. But yeah, right. So what about that? Well, I know my husband didn't like her at all, but I always kept her, kept her in there, you know, kept kept her in our in our lives, mm-hmm. you know. So do you feel like you could see in her that she was going to really be an asset for you? She was a very important press agent. Yeah. Oh, she was. So you went she right to the top, agent. kind of. She was a press agent, uh-huh, you know? Uh-huh. And I had to pay her. And that I, I always paid her a percent of everything I did. Oh, because that's tough, too. Here you are struggling to make a living yeah. and to pay for the house and for the kids. And then you have to make the decision is do I invest in a press agent? I invest in that because press. that's what it is. An Absolutely investment. invest in a press agent. But you paid her a percentage, which I think is not. Is that normally how it is now? I don't probably think not. so. Probably I think not. it's, it's probably a flat something fee huge, every yes. huge fee. So that if I didn't work very much, she didn't get very much. Exactly. And I think that people go on hiatus with their publicists now because they can't afford. It. No, you you will hire somebody just for a campaign. You've got a yeah. picture. You push that, but Barbara was with me all the time. Mm, mm-hmm. Excellent. So people saw things in you. You saw something in her. Well, and she was kind of a, a, a burden to me after a while because it mattered more to her than it did to me sometimes. You know. So oh God, Barbara's calling again. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I had to keep her happy yes. too. Yes. You know. <laughs> it's so interesting for me to see how passionate you still are about the business. So even though now you stepped away from it, right? You said in the book yeah. that you're that's it for you. You don't yeah. want to act anymore. No, and I don't even know half the people that are acting now. You don't want to act anymore. But it's so interesting how you really get it, how it works, and you're so passionate about it still. Well, my my son is doing so well, Jim Meskimen. My daughter, Ellen Kramer, is doing so well. So they see how it's done. Mm-hmm. And that the brownies and the fairies do not come and find you. Yeah, yeah. No. Yes. You have to make this happen. You are such a role model enterprising you're Mm -hmm. a you're a good role model do you have you like mentored people over the years no you should have (laughs) because people could benefit from no i think my lovely children you know you if you don't have a beautiful home and lovely children and family it's then what have you got you've got nothing Mm -hmm. got nothing as always always very careful with myself uh my health Mm -hmm. uh I, I could size up people fast. I was good at, you know, analyzing people and thinking, 
Not a good idea. Not, not a good idea. So, like, what are we yeah. talking about here? Like, like who? either guys, guys, that's you know, what I thought. yeah, uh-huh. you don't want to hang around with them. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think a good actor is you look at I look at people, and I'm analyzing them. Like my children say, "Mother, you stare at people. Don't do that. You stare at people." Oh, I'm so so sorry. I'm so sorry. But I'm interested in them. I'm interested in them. Look at that. Look at the way they how they handle themselves, you know? So So you're observant. You like to yeah. see people, analyze them, but also try them out. Yes. You like like okay. clothes. I can be you. Yeah. I can. Oh, look at that. I can do that. I'll be you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we all do that a little bit. I don't know if we all do that. I, like, I'm an observer like you. I think I'm always, I'm fascinated by people. Fascinated. And like I can't, one of my favorite things to do is sit down in a public place and just people watch. Just watch people go by. Yeah. It, go by or standing or whatever they're doing. I could sit there like it's a TV and just watch, watch, right. watch. It's That's why my children would say, Mother, you stare at people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Are you having a good time? Of course I'm having a good time. Are you kidding? Well, I want to please you, you know. Oh, well, I'm a people pleaser. Are right. you? Well, so what did you think coming into this? How are you feeling knowing I'm coming here to interview you? Oh, I think it's fun. So I you you fun. were looking forward to it? I Does was. it make you a little bit like uh, stressed out? No, no. I just think it's fun. You know. And and at my age, I, I don't have to prove anything. I don't care very much. I don't care. You know. So we'll just have fun with it. Yeah. You know? Why not? So that's your approach. But not but you yeah. just said you're a people pleaser and you want to see how I'm doing. Yeah. So are you thinking about that during no, our I, I wouldn't no, but I, I I want you to have a happy time. Yeah. I wouldn't be sit here grumpy and not answer questions no because i'm more interested in pleasing you Mm, you're pleasing me see just for the record yeah in case you have any doubts you're pleasing me Mm -hmm. Um, i'm having a great time good uh because i'm sure you've interviewed people you can't get a word out of them yes you can't get anywhere yes not that many but enough and Yes, some, I've had more difficult interviews. I mean, certainly much more difficult. This is not, you. this wouldn't be categorized like that at all. Um, I did have one interview in particular that I knew this man did not want to be doing this, and but he had to. Yeah. For some reason, somebody made him do it. Yeah. And he did not want to be there in the room. I knew it from the second I shook his hand and throughout the entire interview, and then when it was over and I listened to it, and I thought, he was miserable. And I'm not a big people pleaser, but I think that I am. I feel like I don't think that I am, but I probably am, because I was raised in a family of people pleasers, and I'm the least people pleasing. However, I, where was I going with this? Uh, well, it's not a it's not a sin to be a, a people pleaser. Yeah, uh, I would say I've always looked out for number one in a way, so that I can get what I want by you know wooing these people, right? Giving you know? them what they yeah, want. Yeah, right. It's it makes. In fact, when you look at the way the whole universe is set up, everybody wins. If I please you and you please me, and we, yes, yeah, we're all working. Everybody, we're wins. all working together on this, right? That's so. We're all winners. Exactly. I am with you on that. I'm going to close with one specific question. Who do you think people think Marion Ross is? Who is Marion Ross to everybody out there? I think people think that I'm a really nice person, and I'm not very threatening. And not very, isn't she nice? Isn't she a nice person? Yeah. I think, I, think they're, I think they're mildly interested because, <clears throat> because I've avoided scandal. So we, what, they, what they lately love, they love to sit and talk about people who screwed up their lives, made a big scandal, and I've, I've deprived them of that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please be patient with me. I have a few more years, so maybe I can have some terrible scandal.
Reminder, I'm in Los Angeles this week. If you'd like to follow along, you can. I'll be posting photos, videos, behind the scenes news on all my social media platforms. On Instagram, I'm Really Famous Podcast. On Facebook, Kara Mayer Robinson. On Twitter, I'm Kara One to One. That's the number one and the letters T O and the number one. It's really confusing. I feel like it's time for me to change that. Anyway, I'll be thinking about that. If you have any ideas, let me know. Thanks for listening. Talk to you again very soon. Can I put my arm around you? Please. Oh, yeah, you have to ask now. Yeah. Right? Is it stressful? No. Why you sure? I think we're good. Okay, great. I do wonder, Mike, how it feels with this whole thing going on. Well, you just, uh, I never asked before, and now I ask.